All right, I am live. Today is May 17th, Tuesday, I believe. Let's do it. I'm associate member of T3 Trading Group, which is an SEC registered broker dealer and member of Fenra SIPC. All trades placed by me were placed through T3 Trading Group. You should carefully consider whether trading is suitable for you in light of your own financial condition. Position disclosure remains the same. All right. Um, are stocks moving here after hours right now? No, it's big days today. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Where am I? Uh, no, I'm not switching on the video today. I just got to figure out a few things. I'm in my third trading location in three days. And then I think, I think I'll be here again tomorrow, and then Thursday I might be somewhere else again. But let's hop into it. It's a very bullish day for the market. Spies are up over two percent. <clears throat> Qs are up two point six. IWM a very solid three plus percent today. Awesome, very solid from the Russell. It's been key for this market is to see the IWM leading. And we saw the IWM leading today. That was definitely a big signal. All right. So we did kind of discussed a game plan in the morning meeting that was based off the gap. Today's gap is something that we should spend some time talking about because I think it tricked some traders up. And it certainly didn't make capturing this big update today easy. Well, you know, you, you kind of had to already have longs on to really be able to capture the day. With that said, live in the virtual trading floor today, we called the low of the day. We didn't know it was gonna be the low of the day at the time, but we identified it as a good spot to come in for at least a short-term buy. And like I always wanna talk about, game planning is key to this business. You need to have a game plan in place for retracement trades to become potential reversal trades, right? And maybe that's what we're seeing here with the market. Maybe not. I don't know. Well, I still have this daily chart up. Um, the area between 404 and 406 was a really big resistance level for the spies that we had been discussing. We were set to gap above that this morning, which gives you a potential technical uh, breakaway gap. So the chance of a gap and go. But we were gapping up so big that that makes it difficult. I don't like... And the reason I don't like it is because it's usually not profitable in the long run or not profitable. It, it can be profitable in very small time frames. I don't like chasing extension. Chasing extension is generally not going to be a great way to make money. Again, if you want to do small time frame scalps that are based on momentum, fine. Because when you're dealing with buying something that's extended up or shorting something that's extended down, the only way that you can get paid is momentum. So sure, we're potentially looking at a breakaway gap this morning with spies above 406, IWM above 180. Um, you know, uh, I also felt today had a higher potential of being bullish, just because I didn't think that yesterday gave people an opportunity to get stock. And we know what the market dynamics look like, right? We know that there are all these statistics that I don't have memorized that were coming out this morning about how funds are in the most amount of cash they've been in since 9-11 was one of the statistics. And they're more short than they've been in since something else and less long than they've been since COVID and all these statistics were out this morning that we were kind of looking at. I don't remember exactly what they all were, but I know what the gist of them was. It's exactly what we've already been saying. The statistics are just confirming it. No one's long this market. People are in cash, people are hedged, but people are not really long this market. So initially here, I, I think that we're primarily seeing still a, a short squeeze rally in this market, which is what bear market rallies typically are. It's what we saw in the second half of March. And we know that you know a, a strong bear market rally can absolutely rip your face off. I mean, this move in March here, the second half of March was massive. I think like ARC went up 40% in this move, something like that. Um, so, so far we're seeing something that's similar. I mean, we were extremely extended here on Thursday at lows. All we've done is snap back to the space between the 8 and 21 EMA. So the question that we're still waiting for 
is it's really not if we see a lower high at this point it's when and maybe just maybe because I don't want to ever pick tops and bottoms I don't think it's a good game to play maybe just maybe this retracement higher does in fact become a reversal but right now the trend is absolutely down all we've had is an extension bounce here on not great volume these last couple of days to be totally honest into this equilibrium zone so for the moment we still need to be thinking about where that lower high could come in but like I was saying even on Friday last week when the market was approaching $400 we could bounce to 415 and still be bearish the only time that we become not bearish in this market is if we get back above 430 in my opinion right now and even there we only go back to neutral so it just shows you um, <laughs> how weak this market has has kind of truly been but all the same we're getting this bounce you know it's great we understand that there's the potential for a, the market to really be able to squeeze higher maybe you're thinking this morning of the potential of a breakaway gap it's probably what you should be thinking and how you can potentially take advantage of a short squeeze of upside momentum it seems like that's what a lot of traders are thinking about it seems like so many people are thinking about it that the execution might not be easy and that was the problem today right the gap was just so big right we closed at like four hundred dollars yesterday we opened at 406.50 it's a huge gap up so when you're dealing with a gap up like this and this is what i was trying to get across in the morning meeting i was leaning more towards the bull side of the argument but we easily could have just sold off off the open we are in a downtrend we are gapping into equilibrium gapping up in a bearish market into the equilibrium zone is technically something that you want to be thinking about shorting like i'm saying before it's just a matter of where so i can easily see the the bearish argument here on coming in and, and kind of pressing your short button one thing to remember is that the reason why gaps tend to get filled like why this gap would, would usually get filled is usually because people come in and profit take so you know we, we have all these fancy names for gaps right uh, common gaps and area gaps and breakaway gaps and continuation gaps and exhaustion gaps there's so, so many different names and those are the names that I use I know that there's other traders out there like you know Sammy Abusad at, at, at T3 he's got totally different types of names for the same concept that I talk about but what a gap uh, forget about your, your names for a second gap analysis comes down to understanding what the gap does to the buyers and sellers who are already in the market so the reason why breakaway gap tends to lead to a gap and go situation is because shorts getting squeezed is going to be more powerful than profit takers who are already long the reason why a common gap tends to get filled a common gap up is because profit takers who are already long the market tend to outweigh new momentum buyers that might come in and shorts that get squeezed so you got to ask yourself when you're looking at today's market is you like man this is a huge gap up this morning if, if you're thinking about shorting it who, who are the sellers that are going to be closing that gap it's probably not longs because not many people are long except for maybe some of us right maybe it is new shorts coming in that could be could could be that or maybe it is you know funds that are continuing to liquidate holdings who were trying to not be too aggressive and chase price down and say all right this is an opportunity for me to be able to sell some stock so there are probably going to be some sellers present but are those sellers that are present going to outweigh the potential of shorts that, get, that are getting squeezed that's the question that you're asking yourself and the truth of the matter is I didn't know this morning I was inclined to think kind of gun to head market dynamics and everything else higher than lower today but very easily could see an argument for both sides of the market so what do I want to see in order to be actionable this morning is I want to see how the small time frame handles the extension that's initially being created by this gap right <clears throat> That this uh, forces us to again look at how we view extension in the market on any time frame so the way that I view extension is by where the market is trading 
versus the space between the 8 and 21 EMA. And that's what I was saying in the morning meeting today. I was like, guys, like, market close at $400. You know, 80 EMA is going to open up at like 401. And we're going to open up at like <clears throat> 406 and change. We're going to be extended by more than $5 to the upside on a five minute chart. That's a tremendous amount of extension that this gap is creating. And again, it makes sense because there's a massive gap. So is this gap going to get filled because those long sellers are using this as an opportunity to be able to continue to liquidate and shorts are saying, I want more. Is this going to be a gap and go because we're gapping above 406 and we know how market positioning is right now and shorts could potentially get squeezed out of their positions a little bit further, especially as we come into, you know, monthly OPEX. I'm not 100% sure of that answer. I'm never 100% sure about anything, to be totally honest. You can't be in the market. Um, but what I need to see is how the small time frame extension gets handled, right? I need to see, do we go sideways here and let these moving averages catch up? Do we have upside momentum right away? In which case we become even more extended and then we'll need some sort of rest through time or price, but let's these moving averages maybe catch up even faster. Or do we just immediately just heavily sell off all the way back down? We've, we've seen a couple different examples of that recently. Let me see if on my five minute, one of them was, was this day right here, right? Where we, we gapped up, probably not as big as we gapped up today, but we took like eight minutes of rest and then we, we really started moving higher with momentum because that's what you need when you're extended to continue higher is momentum. And then once this ADMA caught up to lows, we had our spot where we could definitely be long versus. Uh, we also had a day, I don't know if I can still see it on my five, uh, this day right here. We also had a day where we had a big gap up. And then... And then they wrecked it immediately price correcting down, lower high, and then, and then, and then came all the way back down. Which one of today, which one of those situations we're going to have today, I don't know. What I like seeing on days like today is time correction. Um, the uh, immediate upside momentum makes me a little bit nervous because that usually is more of a signal of panic shorts and it might not be a sustained bid. Um, immediate selling off like we had that other day is not great either because that's like, all right, longs are like, thank God for this gap up so I can dump stock. If I can get more sideways opening price action that lets these moving averages catch up where the market is staying kind of in a range and equilibrium, that's actually what I usually view as the most bullish because then you're basically getting like a bull flag or a bull consolidation with the flag pole itself kind of being the gap. So when we first open up on a day like today, even if I'm thinking higher, which is what I was thinking, I'm actually still looking to book profit on swings and I'm really not looking to do anything new. It's only after initially this five minute catches up that I, I can start to think to myself on, all right, maybe I can begin to, to look for longs. And the problem when the gap is honestly this big is that a lot of times by the time the five minute catches up is actually when we should be looking at a 15 because it takes so much time and you know maybe not necessarily today perfectly because the five minute caught up at 9.55, but sometimes, especially if today we, we ranged out a little bit higher or maybe we had one green bar and then ranged out, it might not have been until 10.15 that the ADMA and the five caught up. And at that point, it's the 15 minute charts that, that, that becomes the most important. So that's the first thing that I wanna see. So the first time I called out any type of long today was here, was here. It's like, all right. We finally caught up to the ADMA and the market looks like it's pivoting. Guys, I think we can be looking for a long versus versus this low. And if you executed well enough, although that's a failed trade, it should be at least a break even trade for you. And I know individual stocks are doing different things. Some are gonna be acting better off this bounce, some are acting worse. I think Apple was not acting well initially at this point. Apple is one, by the way, that I was referring to avoid. Um, but you know, here I'm, you, know, you could trade the market, of course, or you could be looking at stocks that are correlated to the market or stocks or sectors preferably that are showing relative strength to then get another layer of probability on, on, on the side of your trade. So that was the first trade. And what I said at this time off this pivot, because we got two nice green candles here in a row on the five minute chart, was just be, let's be careful of a lower high. 
right? A lower high in the market here that breaks down to a lower low would potentially be a negative sign. That's actually, I think, similar to that sell-off day that we had over here, right? We immediately price corrected all the way back down. Then we bounced off the ADMA, similar to today, led to a lower high that then led to gap fill destruction. Um, so with today, I was worried about the similar situation. We got back to 406 resistance. 406 is a key level. Yes, we gapped above it, which could have signaled a breakaway gap, but we immediately came back down below it. 406, as you can see here, was a major intraday resistance level. It was only on like the fifth test that we actually started to get back above, and then we had all this volatility with Jerome Powell. Um, so that was that's the first long trade, and I like that trade, but it's the same thing. Get your risk covered. We don't know if this resistance is going to break. We don't know if that lower high is going to come in. Execution's key. Get your resistance covered. And then we failed there. And if I remember correctly, let's take a look at the Qs in the IWM to see if I do remember correctly. I think the other indices actually made a new low here, but the SPIs held up a little bit better. And we had that crazy flip that I was talking about, where in the first 15 minutes of the day, your growth stocks were actually really squeezing higher which was actually a signal that there was short squeezing occurring going back to the gap analysis that we discussed. It almost was like, depend, depends on your stock, right? It, this morning, with, with the gap fill, led ended up really kind of leading to, from that, trying to have that understanding of the perspective of buyers and sellers. The big gap up initially led to, it, to both profit taking and a short squeeze. You had a short squeeze come in in growth stocks and you had profit taking coming in in value names, right? XLE was was uh, XLE was weaker, and just about filled its gap. Uh, let alone, you know, what like consumer staples did, and what utilities did this morning. And I'm still blown by this XLU chart. Uh, just totally, totally crazy. Uh, that was going on while you look at Arc inside and up here, making highs, like giving upside momentum. Like, look what this what this first candle is doing for ARC and probably mostly the growth stocks that you can look at um, as the SPIs were, were trading down here. Qs were maybe a little bit stronger. Um, IWM a little bit stronger. But that actually shows you that that thought process that I'm talking about just before about understanding gap fills versus gap and go situations, it, it actually played out today. It just played out differently depending on which stock and which sector you were looking at. Um, people use it as an opportunity to book profit and the things that they were long into the gap up, like XLE, they also used it as an opportunity to, you know, they also squeezed the shorts that were, were potentially trapped as we kind of gapped higher. So interesting. Um, and anyway, I wanted to see if we got new lows here at uh, 1010 for the Qs and the IWM. Qs did, and IWM did also. Uh, so the second long that was called out today was off of this candle. And it was a similar thought process I was happy with how the IWM was holding up. This 180 is kind of the, the break potential breakaway gap spot here for uh, the IWM, and we did tick to new lows. But to, I just looked at this as like a shakeout candle, like ticking to new lows, but still having this candle close above 180. That actually looks decently bullish to me as these moving averages are catching up. As the 15-minute chart, you know, the EDMA on the five-minute chart, sorry, the 21 EMA on the five-minute chart is usually about the same price as the um, EDMA on the 15. So if you're thinking about equilibrium on multiple time frames, sometimes you can just see where the 21 is on the five to, to know about where the eight is in the 15. Ideally, you got enough screen space, space to be able to see both at the same time. We immediately snap back right back up there. And then the, the Qs were weaker, but they were almost giving a 15-minute correction here as well um, with this little doji that came in. And Apple gave a full 15-minute correction. I remember seeing this doji coming in and being interested in it. And again, this is what a lot of what I'm doing when I'm trading, is I'm, is I'm trying to absorb all of the information. I'm trying to absorb the picture that the market's giving to me by looking at Apple, Microsoft, SPIs, Qs, IWM, ARC, XLE, all that stuff at the same time to see kind of where we're rotating to and where the strength is. Because we saw a total flip, like I was saying, at 9.45. The, the ARC type stocks that were initially given that squeeze totally topped out and even went negative. And at the same time, like your XLU went from positive to down huge V bottom all the way back to making new, I mean, this move is insane. And then XLE, which initially was seeing the profit taking, next thing you know, this is making new highs. We had a total, total 
flip at 945 on relative strength and relative weakness. But if you think about it in hindsight or if you're able to, you know, understand this stuff in real time, it's better. But we start by seeing in hindsight so that eventually we can see in real time. Um, if, if it, it, all, it all makes sense. Oh, short squeeze, and then the short squeeze ends after 15 minutes. That's the opposite of, you know, how when we're gapping down really big and I'm talking about a panic selling low that can be 15 to 30 minutes in. It's the opposite here. Short squeeze that lasts for 15 minutes and then ends. And then this was like, all right, the profit taking is done and now the strength is right back in. Um, so the, the, the second trade that was called out today was, was, was off of this low and it was a similar situation. If you had good execution, you probably got to break even then, and then it failed. And this, by the way, is with us being as patient as we possibly can be, right? That That's your biggest way that you need to handle this type of very large gap to the upside is with patience. Let the information come to you. Okay, let's try it here the first time the ADMA caught up. This could have, even though it didn't, it could have led to a break above 406 new highs, then the market rally is on and the short squeezing is continuing. Or what happened here is actually what happens. And then we get this other little pivot. This doesn't look like a great trade to me, honestly, if you're just looking at the spies. But if you're looking at the spies in conjunction with what the IWM just did, a little shake out of 180 to the new lows and snap right back up, in conjunction with what the Qs just did here, uh, pull back into the equilibrium, in conjunction with uh, Apple giving a full 15 minute correction and giving a little bit of a doji, albeit not confirmed by volume, you say to yourself, all right, what can I buy? I think Apple is actually one of the things that we called out, which once again, ended up being a failed trade, but I hope people are able to execute well enough that they were at least able to be break even on that execution. And then the market really looked like it was failing, to be honest. This candle, I kept talking about this 10.25 a.m. candle today. This is our intraday breakdown candle. This candle is uh, going to be really important. It's notably, at least here with, with the spies, not on big volume. So we do want to note that. Um, but, you know, volume is a layer of probability. It's not the end all be all. So we're breaking down here to new lows on the day on this candle. It's... 15 minute correction to the spies at this point but the candle closes on lows there's no pivot here pivot looking like candle like what we had you know kind of here or what we had with the IWM at 1010 we just close on lows you, you don't just buy off a moving average and hope right you recognize the moving averages as, a, as an equilibrium tool for when you like other things other, another thing could have been an, an inside and up here it could have been a pivot that you could have traded versus none of those things happened we came and closed on lows we had a period of rest and then we broke to new lows and then we broke to new lows and then we broke to new lows and now here we are at 11:45, which becomes the low of the day and it was only at this point that we had our third long but honestly this long here at 10:45, is a very different long than the long at 9:55 and the long at 10:10. It's a very different long because this one is arguably small time frame counter trend, whereas these were still small small time frame potentially with trend. And that's if you assume that the gap up acts as price action, which I, I, I like to do, right? If, if we, you know, the gap is, is like a trade to all the way up here, then this becomes a potential higher low. And then you're looking for continuation on with trend. This is counter trend. And honestly, the only reason I really liked this trade at all was because of the small time, time frame downside extension. It, it was similar to the call out that we had here on Friday at 205 on Friday, where it was it was just, you know, we, we had just sold off from 403 all the way down to 397. You had three big red bars in a row here. This next bar breaks the low and kind of snaps back up. It's almost like a very small time frame red dog retracement or Olden Smith overthrow, whatever we want to call it, um, that we called this out as a long. This trade right here, in my mind, very similar to this trade right here. It's a small time frame counter trend trade where you're trying to take advantage of that extension to see what type of snapback you can get. 
not an A-plus setup. And that's what honestly made today overall so difficult. There was never really an A-plus way to get long. The A-plus way to get long is to still be long from Friday last week. Um, so you do have this potential retracement trade higher, and it works. And the one thing that I mentioned here, and I did describe it as lower probability, but I was thinking about it, obviously. That's why I said it. Was, what if we just went right back to new highs off of this low? And what happened here off the open was that there's too many people right now who are looking for this bear market squeeze, in my opinion. I don't remember reading and hearing and looking at this many people looking for the bear market squeeze the last time we caught it in mid-March. Everyone seems now, even bears in the market, seem to be talking about the bear market squeeze that should come in because of the VIX and positioning and sentiment and everything else. And from my experience in trading, when everybody's looking for the same thing, it tends to either not happen or be significantly more difficult to execute. And, and honestly, if this is our bear market squeeze so far, this these last two days, yesterday and today, were very difficult to actually be able to execute to be able to capture it. I don't think that's actually true with Thursday and Friday. I think Thursday and Friday give us a lot of opportunity to be able to get stock that people could still be swinging. So that's why I, I keep repeating. I was repeating it this morning in the morning meeting. And I know it sucks if you're coming in flat. I'm not helping you, but does it make it not true? You want to just be long from, from Thursday, Friday last week and booking profit into this gap and then being patient as opposed to if you came in flat, you're antsy and you're like, oh my God, do I short because the gap is big? Do I buy because we're above 406? Oh my, I gotta do something. And then you, know, you easily, easily, if you weren't patient this morning, this isn't easy price action, you easily could have just churned yourself down to lockout to your max loss by, by the time any type of rally actually came in. So this trade here is really a counter trend type trade off of this type of extension. But what I was saying as we started to rally back up, I think I said it on the 1055 bar, was so many people are looking for this bear market squeeze right now and everyone's talking about it that, you know, they might needed to have just suckered people in here early on in the day, not given that follow through, shake out all the day traders, honestly, and then, and then allow the market to be able to kind of capture more of a bid. And that is what happened. You know, just when you're starting to potentially give up on the market today because, you know, we're breaking through equilibrium on certain time frames, though, the 15-minute chart, look at this 15-minute chart here, is still intact. It's just a deeper pullback than we want, right? No one wants a pullback to the lower band of equilibrium on the 15-minute chart. Um, and I remember looking, I think, at Apple at that time and thinking that Apple on this inside 15 and up could, could actually start to support the market a little bit. Uh, so that's exactly what happened. You still have to treat this trade for what it is, though, which is counter trend on every time frame. So you, you book your profit at one to one. You book more into the moving averages. You book more into 404. And then maybe when this candle closes here at highs, you're like, okay, this is looking a little bit better. And the candle that really got me feeling more bullish was actually this one, the 11.15 candle. Because this, you can see here with this tail, I remember seeing this candle in real time as it was open, being at lows. I'm like, all right, a lot of volatility. They, they, they juiced this bounce here more than I would expect that they would if it was just gonna be a bounce. But that's what happens when there's increased volatility and now we're about to go down and then holy cow look at this pivot coming in oh this candle just closed well oh we're back at 406 so I still think that you gotta treat this as a counter trend trade you cover your risk you take more off into equilibrium you take more off into 404 because you think it's gonna be a tr trouble spot and then you're holding 10 to maybe 25 percent of your position to see if this retracement higher becomes a reversal maybe it could be on the upper end of that percentage if you're thinking my thought process of they needed to make this difficult for people. And then we kind of just went into this upside grind. Fifth test of 406, we break to new highs. Powell speaks. I talked about this already in real time on, on how this price action worked. Initial uptick, there is some volume on that uptick. They break that low, all that volume's out of the money. They sell it off, 
get they get it back to neutral here. All that sell volume becomes out of the money, and then they overshoot it actually actually to the upside. Um, so uh, it's very is ripping right now again. Holy cow! Uh, stock's been nuts. So that's today's price action. And at the end of the day, honestly, we have a very bullish looking candle on low volume and a bearish looking market. So we're going to run into some, let's see how we gap tomorrow, or we might run into similar situations tomorrow, right? Th this candle looks like higher, how this candle closed today and closed on highs. But we are coming right into this very sharp downtrend line. We're right into this equilibrium area. 410 is a big level. Honestly, the whole space between 410 and 414 is resistance. So it's like, it's been one of the, one of the I think, the difficult things about this market rally here. It's like we had 402 we were looking at yesterday. But if we break 402, we run into 404 to 406. And then today we battle a lot of the day today with 406. And it's like, all right, you break 406, and you know what? We do have a pocket of $4 there of upside room. But then you run into four, this whole 410 to 414 zone. This market's got a lot of work to do in order to go higher. The dynamics are definitely still there where we could get a furthering of a um, bull market rally. I actually don't even necessarily know if it's a bad thing that we're rallying on low volume. Because if that happens again, that volume might have to start increasing because these shorts are going to start saying WTF. I'm starting to get hurt on the short position and I've got no longs on. What do I do? Um... So, so we'll see. As far as individual stocks go today, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it because we just did a really big kind of gap review lesson of today's price action. But, you know, one of the things that we wanted to focus on were the semiconductors today. Uh, semiconductors were great, though. I know that that pullback to lows today maybe shook some people out in, um, thanks, Mike, uh, maybe shook some people out in Micron. Like when this Mike, Micron looks so good. This new low came in. It might have shaken some people out. Uh, NVIDIA made a new low there. That Sox L also broke the opening low. If you gave anything to the original stop loss that we were talking about, if you didn't raise the stop, which I would have raised the stop, so if you raise the stop, I don't blame you. If you gave anything down to yesterday's highs, which is what we were talking about for an original stop loss, you didn't get shaken out. The only one that didn't break its opening low was AMD. But AMD, I also thought, even though it got upgraded this morning, was the only one that did not have an actual daily chart set up today. I do think it's broadly bullish that AMD got back above $100. It's now extended on the daily chart to the upside also. Um, so that's it. So I, all I got for you guys, hope that was a good little lesson for people. And I'm happy to answer any questions that people might have. Yes, Sergio, I know I answered this already, but I'll repeat it because the broadcast is on. Give the Derek the Trader YouTube a subscribe. One of you guys gave me a really good compliment. I think it was Rich about how it's incredible that I only have like 900 followers on the YouTube when all these charlatans have hundreds of thousands. So let's, let's build that up. <laughs> Give it a subscribe if you haven't already. Um, from DJ here. Uh, from DJ, I noticed you often enter a stock before a candle gives you closing confirmation, entering on what looks like a five minute reversal hammer before it closes. How often do you wait for the candle to give closing confirmation before entering? Uh, does it depend on the setup or is it something you don't use as, as much as an experienced trader? Um, it's a really good question and it's actually something I don't have a hard fast rule for. If you wait for the candle to close, you have your confirmation. One of the things I I do pay attention to, honestly, constantly is the time. Um, when I'm looking at candles forming on five and 15 minute charts, has this 15 minute candle been open for one minute or has it been open for 13 minutes? Because if it's been open for 13 minutes, I got a, I got a good idea of how this 15 minute candle is most likely gonna look as it, as it closes. And that, will actually give me more confidence to take that buy without waiting for the candle to close, knowing that I'm towards the end of the period. So I, I, I do pay attention to that. And it is always a little bit of a cheat to do it before the close actually comes in. But I don't know. 
if, if I if I have strong confidence, then I take that cheat because taking the cheat will oftentimes mean a better risk reward. It also means though that there's a chance that I buy something that I never would have bought had I actually been patient. So I could take a loss on something that I never would have been in to begin with. But that also then goes back to paying attention to the actual time and the moment. You know, this five minute candle is going to close in 45 seconds. It looks ready to go. I'm just I'm I'm in. I'm not waiting. Um. So I, I, hope, I hope that helps. <clears throat> Gabriel did not take the last long because it was counter trend. Didn't want to risk more. I took the first two longs only. I, I hope, Gabriel, you were able to execute well enough to be able to... Um, uh, to be able to uh, get at least break even on those first couple of trades. The execution today was... The execution today was, was not easy like we talked about. You really had to be patient. But that's how you deal with a large market gap up. Um, thank you, Aaron. From Ahmed. You always let's see. You always say let's see what they're going to do tomorrow. Who are they? <laughs> Just the market participants. You know. So let, let's let's see what they do tomorrow with the gap, right? Like how do the market participants, how do the future traders gap us tomorrow and you know I, I am a am, it's not that I don't do research at night I do do research at night I tend to do more broader research at night or the research I do at night is research where I'm playing catch up on the day like you know I get busy during the day and maybe even though today I, I did listen to everything that Jerome Powell said but maybe as an example I didn't get to listen to as much of Powell as I would have liked so I'm going to go back and I'm going to do some research on what happened today. I don't really do research for tomorrow today, or tonight, I should say, because I don't know how we're going to gap. I don't know what new news is going to come out. I don't know what's getting upgraded and downgraded. So I do more like review today. So you review, you journal and review the trades that you took. You review um, the new information that took place during the day if you didn't have the time to fully digest it during the day. And then the next morning, you wake up early and you do your research. Um, got you, Gabriel. Jackie, could you please go over some of the potential trades you saw in AMD today? So honestly, AMD was not the one that I wanted to go to. I said I said that in the morning meeting, and that was because I didn't like the daily setup. I liked the relative strength. I liked the upgrade. But I don't like yesterday's candle here for AMD with this big tail as opposed to Micron. I thought Micron had actually a much better daily setup today. I thought that NVIDIA had a much better daily setup today. And what I said in the morning meeting was instead of trading AMD, I actually would probably would most prefer to trade Sox L because AMD got the upgrade but doesn't have the setup. Micron and NVIDIA have the setup but they don't have the upgrade. So if I go to SoxL, I can get a little taste of all of it, right? Because it's, you know, ETF and it's leveraged and it's cheap and I like the price of it too. I can get, you know, good good position sizes on it. And I didn't end up trading any of those names today, uh, but they were all, you know, focused stocks for the team kind of based on the morning meeting. So the first answer to your question on, can I go over the potential trades of CNAMD? AMD is, sure, I, I can do that for you, but I didn't, I didn't really honestly identify any trades in AMD today. Honestly, that's not entirely true. The only trade that I identified in AMD today was a short, and I didn't call it out to the team because I didn't like it because I thought AMD was too relatively strong. The only trade I saw in AMD today was shorting it back through 100 when it broke here because of how extended it was. I know We all know AMD is a significant level at $100. And they break this thing through 100 bucks with the ADMA at 97. I'm talking about extended by 3% plus on a five minute chart here. So, and uh, on this type of name, you know, not every stock is Apple that likes to hold its levels so perfectly. On this type of stock, you know, let it break through the level and then short it on the way down, right? Look at all the volume that came in on that candle, too. So the only real trade I personally saw intraday today in AMD was actually a short back through 100 versus because of the extension 
um, on the break of such a key level for 35 cents risk with that high. And I didn't, I didn't even like it enough to call it out to the team. Um, and, and why? Because look at the relative strength, right? I've got relative strength as a layer of probability against me on that trade. So it was more to me like, and I wasn't really looking for this trade either, but instead of taking this small time frame short here, which you probably actually could have made a few dollars on that, I, I would actually rather see what type of correction comes in as it comes back through $100 to see if it sets you up for, for high, for higher price action. You know, and, and, and the 100 level ended up being really sloppy here. Goes to 5 cents here. Goes to 85 cents here before giving you a little bit of a shooting star and pulling back. Again, all this candle means is a, is a pullback to equilibrium. One of you guys, it might have been Mike, I don't remember, actually asked me about, intraday asked me about that he took the long here at 1115, my opinion on it. And I, and I like that trade. I, don't, I can't say I love it. I'm going to say I like it. Um, what I like about it is this is when 11.15 is when the market was make, was pivoting at the low of the day. Look at the continued relative strength in this. And now, as opposed to these previous times when it was breaking where it was fairly extended from the equilibrium zone each time, now after having, you know, you got your fourth test of $100 and you've had almost you know, two hours of corrective action to satisfy that upside extension that caused it to fail these previous times. So you have a little bit of a nation bar here on volume. So this is a trade you could have taken. Threw 100 bucks on the fifth try. Not an easy trade because it's already been as a sloppy level, but you got some other layers of probability here that are very clear, relative strength. And, and again, you know, if you're looking for the market to retrace here, then you're looking for things to be relatively strong. Um, and this is where your relative strength is. So that's it. That's it. Those are the only trades I see in the stock. Everything else would have just been position management. Even even this retest of 100 that held a support is fantastic. I don't know if I would have taken it as a trade because you got, you're like catching a falling knife with Jerome Powell talking. It's very hard. I thought we were going to get back to neutral to where we started from. I wasn't willing to put my money on it. I did not trade this this period of time here, and I tend to trade like Fed stuff very actively. I did not trade this period of time actively at all today. I just didn't have a good feel for it. It just seemed like nothing new was happening. It seemed like Powell was a little bit dovish to me, but the market was going down. I just didn't. I wasn't super active there. Um, so I hope that helps. Jackie with some follow-up. Me too. I was focused on MU today, but w was thinking about it long, maybe through 100, when it was testing for about the third time. I wanted an inside candle at 11.10, though, which we didn't get. Yep. No problem. I hope, I hope it helps. Uh, from Chase. Can I go over Boeing and explain what was going on with the massive volume and explain it if and how you would have traded it? Sure. So uh, I don't like to trade Boeing kind of as a rule. Um, I'm going to start with that. This is like, I don't really have like a straight do not trade list anymore. There was a time when I was a new trader that I actually had a straight up. And, and this could be a good thing for certain new traders also. Is Stocks are like people, right? They all have their own unique personality. And you're going to get along with some better than others. Um, and you want to focus on the stocks that you understand better than the stocks that you, you don't. And I have found price action in certain stocks, and you guys hear me say some of them all the time, that the price action on them is just very tricky from an active trading perspective. So I tend to not go to them. And Boeing, and again, it's not a hard, fast rule for me. It's more of a, you know, prefer not to <laughs> list for me. Boeing is on that list. Walmart's on that list. Disney's on that list. I talk about those guys a decent amount about how I don't like trading them. But Boeing's certainly on that list. I don't know what happened. Boeing's got a lot of news going on right now. My buddy who's a pilot has been sending me texts and information about some of the stuff with China and how it relates to Boeing. And um, I don't know. He was sending me a thing today that maybe it looks like the, uh, the, the pilot there for the China airline, you know, maybe killed himself, which is obviously very sad and 
all those other people that are on that full plane. But we had the news hit yesterday that China was not going to buy, I think that happened right here, any more of this, was it 737? So that hit the stock down really hard. I don't know if this was some sort of reverse news or not. Massive volume coming in. It looks This looks like news. But we don't have Pat today, so I don't know what the news was. We need Pat back. Pat's back tomorrow. We're never going to let him go on vacation again. Um, so this just looks like a news event to me. The way that I trade news events when I trade them is we, what you want to do is try to identify how significant the news was as fast as you can and then see what price you can get versus the low of the news move. If you think, and this is definitely subjective, that the risk that you're taking based on what the news is, is worth it. Um, yeah, I figured it was something like that, right? Crash in China, uh, determined to be pilot per... Okay, there you go. That's so scary and sad. Um... So it was not related to the plane having technical difficulties. So maybe, you know, the Chinese, uh, you know, continue to buy the planes, which would be good for Boeing. And I think we saw some other negative comments coming out of, like, was it the Ryanair CEO yesterday? That, that Boeing's got to get their, you know, what together. But anyway, this is, this is a news move. So I'll just tell you how I trade news moves. I try to identify, so usually... Not the last couple of days to the same degree, though I, I appreciate the help of Bill and Damien and Josh and Colin and everybody else who's gotten some news in the virtual trading floor in Pat's absence. But usually we get the news in the VTF very quickly. So Pat gets that news in there. I look at what the news is. I look at where the stock is trading versus where the low of the news move is. And I, and I just ask myself, do I think that the risk is worth it based on what this news is? And if the answer is yes, then I take the offer, depending on provided the spread's appropriate. <clears throat> so, if I saw that news very quickly and I see that the stock's at you know 120, I don't know 12940, and the low of the news move is 12808, I gotta ask myself if that dollar thirty of risk is worth it, because the stop loss, I, you gotta, you, you only know. If the news move is a failure, if the news move low breaks. If this is important news to the stock, the news low should never break. I know that Josh tried to do that with Peloton today and got stopped out, right? Some news came out about, you know, some debt that they're raising money on or something. Josh thought it was good. He tried to buy it. Broke this low. Market said, we don't care about this news. That's what the market said. You get yourself stopped out. Um, so it's the same thing here. But the other side is, is the risk reward worth it? So is it is a dollar worth it versus this low off of that news? I don't know, maybe. I don't think I would have traded that news. I don't I don't like to trade Boeing to begin with, and I don't know the story well enough or the company well enough to know the degree of significance of that news and the impact that it could happen on that it could have on the stock. So I'm probably not paying a dollar ten in it. Or maybe you didn't type it up until the stock was at one thirty one because we don't have Pat today and we're all slow on news until Pat gets back. Is it, is it worth it to buy this thing with $3 worth of risk off that low based on the news? The answer is still maybe. It depends on the type of news, right? You know, like like the one thing that I like to, to half joke about, the one news where you press that short button no matter what and just go for a walk is, is if you hear a few key terms. If you hear accounting fraud or FBI rated corporate offices or Ponzi scheme. You hear one of those three terms, you, you press your short button. It, let me tell you, it would be an $130 stock. I'm not saying it's Boeing, but if, if Boeing is doing an accounting scandal or whatever $130 stock you're looking at, and you can get $3 in risk versus the news low high, I'm pressing my short button and I'm going for a walk. You know? So it depends on the type of news. So you got to try to digest the importance of that news versus the price that you get versus where the news low is or news high is to make it worth it and then how, you know, how fast you can be.
right? Sometimes we get the news in the virtual trading floor so fast that the stock hasn't even reacted yet. Other times I type that thing up and I'm like, oh my God, I'm late on this. There's already been a huge move. I, I, I'm not, I, I, sounds great, but not, not at $5 risk, right? So I hope that helps Chase. No problem. All right, gang. Well, it's five o'clock. It looks like I got through the questions, so I'm gonna wrap things up today. Um, good day for the market. Not the easiest day from a trading perspective. I hope people navigated it well. Patience was the key with this gap. Have a great night, everybody. I'll see you all tomorrow.